Um, I'm just checking that the audio is working. Yeah, it's working there on the live stream. Hello, everybody on the live stream as well. Shall we pray as we come now to the Lord's word? Father, we ask that you would give us fresh ears this morning. Lord, that you would open our hearts to really perceive what it is that you're saying to us, your church here, sat in Wolverhampton. And Lord God, we pray that you would give us that childlike hunger to hear the words of our Father, to be shaped by them, to be nourished by them, and to grow in all the ways of Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would help me not to get in the way of what it is that you're saying to your people today, but that through me your spirit would move powerfully. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning is going to be a bit different. We are covering a new series. We're going to be jumping into the Psalms for the next six weeks of the school holidays. And I decided to start with Psalm 2. Why start with Psalm 2? Well, perhaps some of you who were with us right at the beginning of Hope City Church might know the answer to this. Does anybody know why? Mum? Exactly. The very first sermon series of Hope City Church was actually Psalm 1. And you can actually listen to it. It was preached on Lower Green um, through a little microphone, uh, that we use, a headset mic that we use on the street still. So if you do want to listen to that and catch up, then please feel welcome. It's on the podcast. So that's why we're jumping into Psalm 2 today. Now, Psalm 2, the title of it is, Why Do the Nations Rage? Why do the nations rage? Rage, a wonderful question that the psalmist asks. And I want to actually begin with a quote from one of my favorite preachers, Martin Lloyd Jones. And he said this The Christian who knows their Bible will not be surprised with the world and the way that it is. And that's why in this church we are committed every Sunday to hearing God's word verse by verse broken down and preached expositionally that's why we do it because we believe that the framework through which God wants us to view reality is his word is the scriptures and when we put these lenses on and look out at the world around us it makes everything fall into place It makes sense of everything. As Lloyd-Jones said, the one who understands their Bible is not surprised with the world and the way that it is. And I feel in this day and age, we Christians as a church, we need to move back towards viewing the world through the lens of Scripture. And as we do, brothers and sisters, it will make sense of so much that appears confusing at face value. Does that make sense? So the question is, why do the nations rage? Why do the nations rage? Why do the nations rage? That word in Hebrew, rage, it evokes images of the sea in stormy weather, waves crashing on board boat decks out at sea. That is the image that we have laid before us and that's the question that I want to ask today there's two things really that I want for us to come away from this study knowing firstly is that there is no such thing as neutrality in this world when it comes to the issue of Christianity Neutrality is a myth. Neutrality as regards God and his son and his word is a myth. It it doesn't exist. And I want for you to come away from today understanding that. It's a pagan belief. The idea that everybody is just born neutral towards God's word. That everybody just takes it at face value and evaluates it based upon evidence and reason. That is a pagan lie. (laughs) The Bible doesn't tell us that. 
In fact, Romans 1 says that the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Did you catch that? Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Who suppress the truth. And the picture there in the Greek is a, if you imagine you're in a swimming pool on holiday, as I know that the Walls family have just been, and I toss Steve a beach ball as he's in the pool. The idea is that Steve would grab the beach ball and stuff it down under the water. Have you ever tried to do that in a swimming pool and sit on a beach ball and hover? I've done that before. Maybe it's just me. But that's the picture in Romans 1, is that actually, naturally speaking, mankind takes the truth of God, stuffs it down underwater, and tries to hold it there. And it's difficult. It's not easy to do, is it? Hold a beach ball underwater. And so what's the picture? It's that man is trying his hardest to blur and hide and hold down the truth. The truth of the reality of God and of their nature as his creatures. That's what man is desperate to hold down. They don't want that to be true. It's not always that atheists <laughs> at bottom have found a reason not to believe in God. It's that they have a reason for not believing in God. Does that make sense? That's what the Bible says. And I hope that today we come away knowing that, that we're not anymore believing that lie that the rest of the world is merely neutral to God. They've got some wonderful reason, some evidence that explains away his existence and, you know, we Christians, we're just backward, bigoted folk who haven't yet figured it out. Actually, the Bible says, no, unbelief is as old as creation. It's as old as the fall. And it's not rational. It's that same hatred that Joseph's brothers had for him. You remember in Genesis, it says his, his brothers could not love him for they hated him they they had a hatred for joseph therefore they could not love him it's the same for all natural born men they're not natural they're not neutral to god they're actually raging against him and so that's what we're going to look at today we're going to come away hopefully understanding that as christians with the knowledge of the fact that the world's not neutral the world's not neutral to god the world and its flow is against the things of god right? That's the flow of the world. It's away from God, away from the things of Christ. Now, I want for us not only to understand that, but I want for us to get this. Living for the approval of a world that hates God and hates his son is not a good way to live. Living for the approval of a world that is running headlong away from God is not a healthy way for a Christian to live. I think it was Malcolm Muggeridge who said that only dead fish swim with the current. <laughs> you know, only dead, no, only dead salmon swim downstream, that was it. Only dead salmon swim downstream. And there's a, there's a picture here of us as Christians. Is that if we are living in such a way that we never believe anything that would cause us difficulty in the world, that we don't live in such a way that causes the world to get upset with us, it's quite possible that we are no different from the world. And that actually we are not following Christ, but we're in the flow of the world. We are not alive but dead. Does that make sense? If we're content and we want for all of our beliefs to be celebrated by the world, there's a chance that maybe we're not fully really living for Christ. The psalm divides up into four parts. You may have seen that in your Bibles. Verses 1 to 3, I'm going to call the nations. This is the voice of the nations. Verses 4 to 6, we read about God in the heavens. Verses 7 to 9, we read of a king seated on a throne. 
And then in verses 10 to 12, we read of an edict from the throne, a message that thunders forth from the throne of the Messiah out to the nation. So it divides up into four. Originally, just for those of you who are interested, this psalm used to be part of Psalm 1. It was conjoined there with the same psalm. And we believe because the uh, book of Acts quotes it, it's a psalm of David. It's quoted again in Acts 4. We'll, we'll focus on that shortly. This is a psalm of David. And it's a messianic psalm. It's a messianic psalm. What does that mean? It means that it has its fullest fulfillment in Christ. It has an Old Testament fulfillment in the person of David, but it has a New Testament fulfillment in the person of of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look first and foremost at this first section. Why do the nations rage? Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves. They set themselves against what? Against the Lord and his anointed. The kings, the rulers, the powers that be in this world, they set themselves in opposition to whom? Not to one another, but to the Lord and his anointed. It actually says, interestingly, that these rulers take counsel together. They find a unity in their opposition to God and his chosen Messiah. Isn't that interesting? That despite all the differences in the world, unbelievers will find unity in their opposition to God and to Christ. You notice this. The writer of Psalms doesn't say that the kings and the rulers set themselves against God. Do you know, there's very little opposition in this world to the idea of, of God of some vague belief in a higher power. Have you noticed this? I, I don't know if you ever watched Oprah Winfrey. Not many people on Oprah Winfrey have a problem with a vague belief in God. You can believe in God. You can believe in the kind of God that makes you a better person. You can believe in the kind of God that gives you an inner peace and a sense of meaning and purpose. You can believe in the kind of God that helps you do acts of kindness, acts of charity but the minute you believe in the kind of God who has a Messiah and that that Messiah is the Christ of the Bible now that's different the world doesn't celebrate that kind of a belief and interestingly here in the Hebrew the word here is this against they take counsel against the Lord that is Yahweh and against his Mashiach his Messiah that is what the world is opposed to. The world is not opposed to your vague belief in some kind of higher power. Why? Because that isn't of any threat to it. The world is opposed to a God who is sovereign and to a God who sets his king upon the throne. Why? Because the world wants autonomy. Just a few weeks ago, I don't know if you remember this, but we had to find different routes to come into church because a lot of roads were shut down. Uh, and the reason was because there was Wolverhampton's 10K race going on. And so we came out, we found our way around the race, and, and out on that main road there, on the Stafford Road, you, you could see the race uh, taking place and the people at the side just cheering their friends on as they run the race. And it's interesting, I thought, wouldn't that be great to have a crowd cheer me as I come out of the door on Sunday with two children who don't want to be going to church and I get into my car, sweaty and tired with all my bags and baggage and I've got people going, woo, come on, yeah, come on, let's get to church. And as I drive, I've got stewards in green tabards flagging me into the church car park and come on, Pastor, wow, woo. I say, I say this, right, if, if you want to be seen as a moral, good, upstanding person this day and age, don't become a Christian. Just download Strava and sign up to a 10K. 
everyone will think you're a great person. It's true. Start doing park runs and everybody will think you're the most moral person ever to walk the earth. Why is that? Why is that the case? Because this nation and the West has sold you the lie that they're not religious. They're secular. They don't believe in anything. They've sold you that lie and we believed it. This nation's not secular, brothers and sisters. There's a false idol on the throne of this nation and of the West. Do you know what that idol is? Any ideas? Self. Self is a false idol. Self is a pagan god who they have put on the throne of their lives. And that is why they hate the Christian God. Because that God is sovereign. That God demands worship. That God dethrones self. He's not content to be worshipped along with a pantheon of other gods. He's not content to sit side by side with you and be worshipped as God. He wants to dethrone every false idol that has ever been worshipped and he will allow himself and himself alone to be given the highest praise and worship. That is why the world hates the Christian God, the God of the Messiah. And that is why in this nation we worship anything that points inward to self. Now I love running. I have no issue. Don't, don't go around telling people that Graham hates 10Ks and he thinks you should never run a park run. I don't. I go jogging myself. But isn't it interesting to you that all the big races take place on a Sunday morning? People don't twig that, oh, that's, not, that's nothing to do with that. It's just because, well, isn't it interesting? Just think about it for a minute. If the powers that be, the rulers, the kings, the culture, the media, if all of this is true, that actually they do set themselves against God and against his anointed, and that their flow is away from the things of God, what do you think their agenda might be? What do you think their agenda might be for you? Keep you away from church, maybe? The most offensive message you can preach to a Christian in this day and age is this one. Go to church on Sunday. People, that's legalism. How dare you preach legalism? Obedience is not legalism. It's not legalism to obey God. But the enemy, by simply creating this false religion in our nation and then selling the lie to everybody that it's not a religion, it's just neutral, okay? Nobody here is worshipping a false god. We're all just out here being super neutral and not really believing in anything. Because a lot of Christians have believed that, they haven't realized the undertow, the undertow current that is dragging them away from the things of God slowly and surely and consistently. For decades, they've not seen it. And now many Christians are out at sea. How many Christians do you know? Don't go to church anymore. I still believe, but I don't, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't believe in organized religion. I still you know, have a faith. A faith in what God? That's the question. Now, this psalm is quoted again quite often in the New Testament. I don't know if you know that, but I want to invite you to turn your Bibles quickly open to Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 4. And I hope, I hope you understand, I'm not trying to attack anybody this morning. I know sometimes talking about these things can sound confrontational. That's not the heart. It's just simply to point out some things that I believe have been going on for generations in this country that are part of that flow and that people have been sold this lie that it's, it's nothing malevolent, it's just neutral. And actually the enemy has kept us from persecution in this nation. I believe that. I, I believe that the enemy has kept us from persecution. And so it hasn't really cost anything to be a Christian in the West for a long time. And that's happened for generations to the point now where 
Christians just assume that they should have the freedom to worship and nobody should have a problem with that. And then all of a sudden when we face the least bit of persecution or challenge to be faithful to God, we crumble because we're just not used to it. And I think that is interesting. Anyway, Acts 4, before I get completely sidetracked. Acts 4, verses 23 to 28. I want you to take a look at this. This is a remarkable passage of scripture. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of their father, David, your servant, uh, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, who you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Listen to that, Herod and Pontius Pilate. What, what's the significance here? Jew and Gentile were gathered against you, both Jew and Gentile, along with the Gentiles of the people of Israel. So Israel, Jew, Gentile, Rome, all gathered against Christ. You see this? Unity. Unity amongst unbelievers against the Messiah. It's happening. It's right here. It's happening. So they're against Christ, against the peoples, uh, uh, sorry, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your plan your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This is remarkable. Psalm 2 tells us that they rage in vain. They rage against God and his anointed in vain. And Acts 4 tells us the reason why it's in vain. Because in all of their sin in all of their scheming and plotting against the Messiah, what did they succeed in doing? What did they succeed in actually doing? They crucified the Messiah. And through his shed blood, what was achieved? The sovereign purposes and plan and will of Almighty God. Through their rebellion, they fulfilled the will of God. Therefore, their rebellion was in vain. God is big, isn't he? God's ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes it blows my mind to think about some of these things. Because catch this. What did God predestine to take place then? What did God predestine to take place? Everything that Herod and Pilate and the Jews did to Jesus. That's what it means, isn't it? But what did they do to Jesus? They sinned against him, didn't they? They plotted against him. They schemed against him. They killed him. Was that a sin? Yes. Did God predestine sin? Yes. The penny's just dropped, hasn't it? Some people get very upset about this. God, God would never ordain sin. Well, he did it here. And it's the biggest sin of all time. Did God commit the sin? No. It was done by the hands of lawless men. Is God therefore guilty of the sin? No. But get, did God ordain it? Yes. Is your brain starting to spin? Good. <laughs> this is the biblical witness of the sovereignty of God and the freedom of man. Man is free to choose what he wants or she wants to do within the sovereign purposes of God. And that even includes the bad things that they do. God still is able to work those things according to the counsel of his will. It does not make him guilty of those actions. So let's just sit with that for a moment and let that percolate <laughs> and move on for a moment. But you can see how it's completely vain to try and thwart the purposes of a God like Yahweh. That's a great quote. I just wanted to put that one up there from earlier. The greatest weakness in the church today 
is that the servants of God keep looking over their shoulder for the approval of man, just like that 10K race. Many believers, they, they want to be cheered on, right? They, they want to run this race that we're running with, with Christ and have all those green tabards going, woo, yeah, come on, you're doing great. Yeah, listen, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen because they're worshiping a different God. And so we're called not to be offensive in this world. We're not called to be idiots and jerks. And that needs saying today, because if you're on social media, you'll have seen a lot of Christians that are straying pretty close to that line. We're called to live at peace with one another as much as is possible for us. But the message that we carry is offensive to the world. The cross is offensive because it says you're sinners and your sin must be dealt with. And so we've got to stop looking over our shoulder for the world to give us a thumbs up and say, yeah, it's okay for you to follow Christ. It's okay for you to believe that, right? It's not going to happen. Spurgeon makes this point really well. Earth loves not her rightful monarch, but clings to the usurper's way. To a graceless neck, the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but to the saved sinner, it's easy and light. Did you notice this in Psalm 2? The language that's used about the law of God. In verse 3, the kings and rulers say this, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The sense is that they are being shackled by God. His laws are too heavy. They're unfair. How dare he ask me to live a certain way? Is that not just the word of the world right now? The Christian God is restrictive. He's oppressive. He's bigoted. Let us cast his cords away. It's the same voice, isn't it? You see, some people think in this day and age that all the hostility to Christianity in the West is because of higher education. You know, because we've, we've been to uni. we figured it all out. We, we know what's right and wrong now. We're clever. We're smart. No, 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 no. The same thing has been happening since the fall. Man has been looking at God as, a, as, a, as an ogre, as a bigot, as a horrible God who wants to shackle us and prevent us from living the fullest, freest life. The root of unbelief isn't education, it's sin. So what hope is there? What hope can there be? If we live in this world that is utterly hostile to God, what hope can there be? Well, verses 4 to 6 tell us something of our hope. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision or mocks them. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. This is the hope that we have, is that our God sits in the heavens. He is sovereign over all. And he laughs. He laughs. Now, is that, that might sound a bit mean, mightn't it? God actually doesn't take the threats of the kings and the rulers of the earth seriously. He doesn't convene his holy council because, oh, they're saying some really mean things about me down there. What do we do? Oh, what on earth are we going to do? The Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. Now, the scariest thing that could possibly happen to any boxer is to set foot in the ring with your opponent and land the heaviest right overhand that you possibly could manage square in the jaw of your opponent and for them him to turn around and laugh. It'd be like being in the ring with Mike Tyson in his prime. Get out the ring. It's the same with God. All the schemes, all the plots, all the hatred of this world against God and God is in the heavens. He's that far above it that he laughs. Why? Because 
even in their raging, they will fulfill his purposes that he declared from the beginning of time. He shall have dominion. And he doesn't even deal with what they're doing. He doesn't even address it. Do you know what he says? He doesn't say, you're doing this. You're saying that. He says, I. Let me tell you what I have done. I have set my king on the throne. And here is why the nations rage. Because God doesn't set an elected official on the throne. God didn't ask for the nations to vote for their chosen ruler who would represent them the best. God set a king, his chosen king, on the throne. A monarch, a ruler who has all authority, who decrees and declares. Brothers and sisters, when we enter into the kingdom, we have a king. We are ruled and governed by a king who sits on a throne. Charles Spurgeon said this, God's anointed is appointed and shall not be disappointed. This is why the world has such a problem with God is because of his godness. He chooses what he will do and no one will thwart his purposes and he has set his king, Jesus Christ, on the throne. And that's why, brothers and sisters, no matter what you hear in the world about the collapse of Christianity, about the next great thing that is going to sweep the church before it, that's why you don't worry. Because God has set his king upon the throne. And a king will have a kingdom, amen? There's never going to be a point in history going forwards or in the future when there are no Christians on earth. Never going to happen until Christ returns. Why? Because a king must have a kingdom. So I don't take too seriously the threats of the end of the church, even though right now, clearly, we are seeing the, the, the wax, and the, we're seeing the wane of the church in the West to many degrees. I know that the tide will come in again because the king is on the throne. And this king... I love this quote here. This king is a king who will have dominion, ultimately over everything. Abraham Kuyper was a Dutch theologian. He said, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. Wow. <laughs> Christ is king. Amen. That's what we preach on the streets. There is a king in heaven right now. His kingdom is advancing. And the issue is not whether you will manage to get the world's approval. That's not, that's not the biggest win in life. Many people think it is. They live for the approval of, of men. They live for the extra Twitter followers. They live for that blue tick, the verified tick on whatever. They live for the approval for men. But that is not the key question of life. The key question is, will you approve the king who does sit on the throne? That's the key question, isn't it? Because ultimately, Psalm 2 tells us that he will take dominion over everything. He has dominion over his people now. But also in verses 8 and 9, it says, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. He doesn't make a distinction over believers and unbelievers, does it? He doesn't say, I will make... The believing nations, your inheritance and your possession. He says, all nations, your possession and inheritance. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All those nations, all those people groups who do not bow the knee to Christ will be dashed to pieces like a potter's shirt. I know in this day and age, we don't like to hear that kind of message about Jesus. We like the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and he is that. But if we neglect to preach to people this truth, that he's coming back, he has ordained a day upon which he will judge the living and the dead, and that all those who have refused to bow the knee to him in this life will be dashed to pieces. And it's a very sobering 
and serious message, one we don't want to see, brothers and sisters, one that God doesn't want to see, who desires all to come to a knowledge of salvation. That's why we go out into the streets. That's why we tell our friends about Christ now, because it's an urgent message, isn't it? It's a very serious and urgent life and death. We don't want anybody to have that fate before them. And so the final message from the king is found in verses 12. Verse 12, sorry, 11 and, 10, 11 and 12. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. On the basis of what we've heard here, brothers and sisters, that God has set his king on the throne, his Messiah on the throne. Now, here's what I'm going to say to you by this. Be wise. Don't be foolish. Don't think, oh, I'm going to live today how I want to live. And when I'm older, yeah, I'll get serious about the things of Christianity. Be wise. Tomorrow's not promised. Be warned. Be warned. This, this is directed to the kings and the rulers of the earth. <laughs> to those who have power, be warned. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. It's a sobering end to this psalm, isn't it? But wait, listen to these final few words. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's the message from the throne room to the rulers of earth. Be wise. Don't be foolish. Be warned. Serve the Lord. Serve the God who does reign. Do it with fear. What does that mean? Does it mean that we're constantly just be like this? Oh, oh, like a beaten dog? No. It means that our lives are to be ordered around God primarily. He is the most important thing that we take due care to in our lives. We take the most care to obey him above all other things, to love and to serve him above family, above friends, above cares, above passions. We fear the Lord above all. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Are you in him this morning? Have you taken refuge in the son let me encourage you and enjoin you to be wise don't put it off till tomorrow you're not too young you're not too old to choose christ and to submit to him and kiss the son today let's stand i'm going to invite the worship team to come